This is the way. Hey, hey, welcome to Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in the new trailer for The Mandalorian Season 3. So, in addition to going through the trailer, I'm going to talk about how it pairs up with the first trailer that was released in September, maybe do a little bit of theorizing, and I'm going to explain a lot of the Star Wars lore that built up to this season. See, Season 3 isn't going to just be a new season of the show, it's going to continue a story that was started in the Clone Wars series, and it's also going to set up the prequel trilogy, so maybe this will finally make sense somehow Palpatine returned. So the first thing is, uh, sorry, it's really hard to focus. I am starving. Mmm. Person, are you eating raw, unmilled rice? Maybe. You've been listless because you never eat a good lunch. Get it together or you are fired. I'm really sorry. I'll eat better. Now back to what I was saying. All right, so we open with seven Mandalorians walking on a ridge, and the one in the front looks like it could be Bo-Katan. Oh, what's a Bo-Katan? Oh, Doug, Bo-Katan isn't a what, it's a who. Very brief recap here of the history of Mandalore, and this won't take too long if you're all caught up with the animated series and this is all old news for you. So, Mandalore has always been a planet of warriors that were prone to civil wars. The Mandalorians were originally united by a Jedi Mandalorian named Ter Vizsla, who wielded the Darksaber. So, the Darksaber Saber has the ability to unite the various Mandalorian clans and houses, and it's won through combat. Like the Elder One. Yep, yeah, just like that. After a war turned their entire planet into a desert, pacifists took control of the planet and built these massive dome cities, while the warrior sect, called Death Watch, was exiled to their moon. Eventually, Death Watch staged a coup on Mandalore with the help of Darth Maul, and this started another Mandalorian civil war. So there's two key players here. One is Duchess Satine, the pacifist leader of Mandalore and the former lover, maybe, of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Had you said the word? I would have left the Jedi Order. And the other is her sister, Bo-Katan Kryze. She was a member of Death Watch, but led the rebellion against Darth Maul after they killed her sister, Satine. At the end of the Clone Wars, Bo-Katan reconquered Mandalore with help from Ahsoka Tano, but afterwards the Empire ousted her from power. So, about four years before Star Wars A New Hope, Bo-Katan regained the Darksaber and united Mandalore against the Empire. Then, Moff Gideon took it from her in a duel, and the Empire decimated Mandalore and pillaged it for the mineral Beskar. These are the spoils of the Great Purge the reason that we live hidden like sand rats. So now Bo-Katan wants to rule Mandalore again, but she has to beat Din Djarin in a duel for the saber. She can't just accept it as a gift like she did last time. It came to me so I could pass it to you. Wow, what is that? That people food looks amazing. Oh, this? This is sun-dried tomato chicken. When did you have time to take a cooking class? Oh no, I'm a terrible cook and this isn't takeout food either. This is a nutritious, delicious, ready-to-eat meal by Factor, the sponsor of this video. Factor is a meal delivery service with menus that are updated weekly with more than 34 chef-prepared, dietitian approved meals. I can choose my favorite meals or let Factor surprise me based on my taste preferences. See guys, I hate cooking. I worked in kitchens for over 10 years, so it always feels like work to me. Factor cuts out meal planning and prep. Factor meals arrive pre-prepared and can be heated in the oven or microwave in just minutes. Plus, they're delivered fresh, never frozen, right to my front door. Factor is great for helping you to accomplish your New Year's resolutions. The meals are healthy and convenient, and they're a great alternative to takeout because they are cheaper and faster. Factor works great for me because there are days when I just get slammed and I forget to eat. So I end up just eating junk, like unmilled rice. But Factor sends me chef-prepared meals that make it easy for me to eat healthy. But how do they make such healthy foods? Well, because they have registered dietitians who work hand-in-hand -hand with their kitchen. So every meal is made from scratch with nutritious ingredients. You can easily adjust your order size, order more for your family, or even skip a week if you're leaving town. So you have to give Factor a try. Head to go.factor75.com slash screencrush60 and use the code screencrush60 to get 60% off your first Factor box. Now back to the Easter eggs. All right, so that's the recap. Now let's get to the trailer. We open on a ridge, which immediately calls to mind the westerns of John Ford. From the very beginning of making this show, John Favreau said he wanted to be inspired by the things that originally inspired George Lucas. But I want to be influenced by the stuff that influenced George. Ford is one of the all-time greatest film directors, and his 1939 film Stagecoach rejuvenated the genre. Before Ford, westerns were shot largely in studios or on backlots. Ford took the productions into the deserts around Los Angeles so he could tell these wide, expansive of stories. His films, especially The Searchers, were a major influence on Star Wars. And then Ludwig Göransson's score hits us with this stinger. That is straight out of the spaghetti westerns of Sergio Leone. 
Now, as for what these Mandalorians are doing, I think that we are going to see a bit of Mandalorian infighting this season. Bo-Katan's group could be on this world to seek out the faction led by the Armor. And the Armor, by the way, could also be from that faction of Mandalorians that were loyal to Darth Maul. She wears horns on her helmet, and so did the warriors who swore for Maul in the Clone Wars. Liam likes Star Wars on Twitter pointed out that the badge on this guy's pauldron marks him as being from Clan Eldar, and in Star Wars Rebels, they pledge themselves to Bo-Katan Kryze. Clan Eldar is with you. Din Djarin narrates, Our people are scattered like stars in the galaxy. And when he says this, he doesn't just mean that the Mandalorians are physically scattered across the galaxy after the destruction of their world, they are scattered culturally. There's different factions of Mandalorians who are fighting to define what a Mandalorian is. Now, we saw in the Season 1 flashback that Din was rescued by Death Watch, and that's the same group that Bo-Katan's sect split off from. So this season could eventually see these two factions reuniting into one coalition of Mandalorian forces. Din hints at this when he says, What do we stand for? Merce Knights. I don't know her, her, her. <laughs> and then we see exactly who the Mandalorians on the ridge are approaching, and this is the sect led by the armor. Now notice this sect of Mandalorians do not share a uniform color for their armor. And this is interesting. Death Watch wore identical blue armor, and for the most part, the Mandalorians in the covert in season one also did. But now we've got more brightly colored armor, different designs. These narrow slits are usually worn by women. For instance, this one is your mom. Now it's nothing new for the Mandalorians to paint their armor. As Sabine Wren said it in Rebels, the armor I wear is 500 years old. I reforged it to my liking. So I think that what we're seeing here is that other Mandalorians have heard that Jarn possesses the Darksaber and that they are coming here to accept him as their leader. Now, Din does not want this responsibility. All he wants to do is purge himself. What do you mean, like throw up? No, <laughs> I mean, you know, purge himself of his sins. What are you talking about? I don't remember any of this from the Mandalorian. Oh, right. Well, that's because there were two episodes of the Book of Boba Fett that basically set up this entire season. Oh, yeah. Right. So in those two episodes, in case you haven't seen it, Din confesses that he removed his helmet and the armorer gave him a quest to redeem himself. One may only be redeemed in the living waters beneath the mines of Mandalore. So that's what he's trying to do this season. Return to Mandalore, fight off the Empire, and take a bath. Yes, and take a bath. And he's replaced the Razor Crest with the Naboo in one starfighter like we saw in The Phantom Menace. Also in the Book of Boba Fett, Grogu started to train with Luke, but decided to rejoin Din Djarin and become a Mandalorian instead of a Jedi. Din's narration continues. You also have to know how to navigate the galaxy that way you'll never be lost. Now, this is really framing that the Mandalorians at this point are a diaspora. What's a disp uh, dispiace? Diaspora. It's any people that are displaced from their homeland, like Jewish people were for centuries. In then we see Mando landing in Navarro, and the place has improved just a little bit every time we've seen it back since the first season. You can tell this because the pagoda has been sculpted and refined with every new visit. Here we see an ivory collar protocol droid, symbolic of the new purity found on Navarro, and a Kowakian monkey lizard climbing a white tree. Big change from season one when they were being roasted on a spittle. This is actually my favorite detail to show how much the town has changed. In the first season, the town was on the wilderness, more like the town in Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch. That was because the first season, especially was a Western, but the whole point of a Western is that the hero civilizes the land and then they move on because they are no longer fit to be in a place that is made for decent people. So after Navarro becomes refined, Mando can never belong there. Carl Weathers' grief Karga is still running the town and notice how now he's wearing the robes of a magistrate, again indicative of the progress the planet has made. Now see these melted stormtrooper helmets? They formed the base of a statue of IG-11, the assassin droid who sacrificed himself to save them in chapter 8. Now grief had a statue built to commemorate his sacrifice. Sacrifice, I think because this is how you actually civilize a place. People need heroes, they need martyrs, because this inspires everyone else to live up to that sacrifice. IG-11 didn't die to save Navarro, but I bet that's the story that grief has spread around. After all, the American West was civilized by stories of the brave men who fought to make it safe for decent folk. The fact that most Western stories are total BS doesn't matter. The West was built on legend. When the legend becomes fact, Print the legend. When Mando greets grief, Carl Weathers replicates the most manliest handshake in film history. You son of a bitch. 
Now there's a couple of Twi'leks on these stairs, and here we see an EV series droid like we first saw in Return of the Jedi. And with Mando, we also see R4-D4 who has finally made it off of Tatooine. This is the droid that blew its motivator in A New Hope, and it appeared in The Mandalorian as a kind of gag because it never got off the planet. But later in this trailer, we do see Peli give the astromech droid to Mando so he can use it for navigation. Which, by the way, is way safer than just throwing Grogu up on a moon roof where he can get blasted to bits. R4 is going to be running around with them now, and I wonder if they're ever going to dive into his backstory from the expanded universe. What backstory is that? All right, so there's this comic book written by Peter David that reveals that his name is Skippy the Jedi droid and that he was force sensitive. He saw through a force vision that R2 needed to go with Luke to save the galaxy, so he blew his own motivator. Wow, a force sensitive droid would like, like that changed everything. That would mean the droids are number five. What? You know, alive. Alive. <laughs> Okay, gotcha. So, Star Wars is kind of weird about this. Like, droids are not appliances, but they're also not people. Like, they seem to have feelings, but they're treated like objects. Because I am your friend. I think they're just space pets that can talk. You know, like, turtle fantasy stuff. Sure, yeah. Then there's a few shots of them flying through an atmosphere where it's raining, symbolic of how their people are lost and scattered throughout the galaxy, and they don't know where they're going. And this is followed by another symbolic shot, the armorer's ladle going into water. Now this symbolizes Din's quest for purity, to bathe himself in the wells beneath Mandalore. And there's also some symbolism here, to a Christian baptism, obviously, to purge himself of his sin of removing his helmet. But also, you know, Mandalore is a desert, yet there is life-giving water beneath the surface. So the restoration of Den's honor will also mean the restoration of Mandalore, bringing water to the people of the desert wasteland. He will be a river to his people. Lawrence of Arabia quote. Nice. It was from this. Because I am a river to my people. So then we see the domed city of Mandalore in ruins. Now we've previously seen it in the Clone Wars and we saw clips of the destruction in the Book of Boba Fett. But now here it is to show us what is at stake for the Mandalorian people. This is intercut with Mando getting his new droid from Peli. And notice the Phantom Menace pit droid doing air traffic control for him. And the camera cuts to Grogu just as Peli says... And this is intercut with flying away from a city during a celebration, which could be the anniversary of the overthrow of the Empire. After all, we did see various planets using fireworks on that day, or they could be celebrating Life Day, the Christmas-esque holiday from the Star Wars Holiday Special. We celebrate a day of peace, a day of harmony. And then we cut to what might be Coruscant, the capital city of the Republic, and then the Empire. Now look, I'm not 100% sure that this is Coruscant, though. Or why not? Well, the capital of the New Republic rotated. First, it was on Chandrillia, home planet of Mon Mothma, and in The Force Awakens, it was on Hosnian Prime. So it could be that it temporarily rotated to Coruscant, but Mon Mothma wanted to disassociate the New Republic from the Empire as much as possible. So I doubt that the capital would ever go back to Coruscant, but this could still be Coruscant, it's just not the capital of the Republic. We see Dr. Pershing. Now, this is the geneticist that the Empire was using to probably use Grogu's blood to clone the Emperor, explaining, Somehow Palpatine returned. Now, I'm not sure what he's up to here. Is he still loyal to the Empire? Is he on Coruscant to get something done for them? Or is he doing clone work for the New Republic? The droid that is piloting his ship looks like Ralph McQuarrie's early design for C-3PO. Well, there's actually a hidden detail that might tell us what Pershing is up to. Brent of Grogu on Twitter pointed out that on the Disney Plus app, there is an extra shot of a Star Destroyer being built. And this same shot appeared in the footage shown at Star Wars Celebration. This shows a Star Destroyer being built on a planet with a city in the background and a figure in the foreground that looks like it could be Pershing. So maybe Pershing is still on the side of the Empire and he's going to continue his work of cloning the Emperor. As I'll talk about later on, the Empire still does exist on some planets, just in a very limited capacity. Neat tie into the Bad Batch here as well. Season one of the Bad Batch ends with Nalase being taken to an Imperial cloning facility where she is greeted by someone wearing the same patch as Pershing does in season one. Now because we see this patch on Kamino clones and Attack of the Clones, this probably marks them as part of the Geneticist Guild. And that planet at the end of Bad Batch is called Wayland. And in the old Legends continuity, this is where Palpatine kept his cloning facilities. So this Star Destroyer could be a remnant of the Empire or a new destroyer for the First Order or one of Palpatine's super secret Sith destroyers from the Rise of Skywalker. Now, as we see the city, Carson Teva narrates. There's something dangerous happening out there. Carson Teva is the X-Wing pilot who patrolled the New Republic space in Navarro, who gave a similar warning to Cara Dune. There's something going on out here. 
And I think this is all hinting to the rise of the First Order. I always, like, I hated how The Force Awakens just begins with a new empire in place because it cheapens the victory at the end of Return of the Jedi. Now, finally, we're going to see how the Republic allowed a new empire to rise from the ashes. See, it used to be that the movies would prop up the shows and books, and now it's kind of become the other way around. Carson is no longer wearing his flight suit. Instead, he's in a New Republic leather jacket with this patch, which I don't recognize. It might identify the fighter wing that he flies with. Notice how he's intercut like he's talking to Din, but they are in totally different places. My guess is that here he is talking to Grief Karga, while Mando is actually in Bo-Katan's throne room that we saw in the last trailer. In that trailer, you could even see the flags of Bo-Katan's sect, the Night Owls. Now, when we see Din underground, he finds an old burned Mandalorian helmet. I actually think he's underground in Mandalore. But what could possibly in best car armor like this. Well, I'm glad you asked. In a pretty great episode of Rebels, the Mandalorian Sabine Wren revealed that when she was in the Imperial Academy, she actually designed a device that would burn best car armor. The Empire later used this on her own people. And this could be a helmet left over from that battle. This device, if reactivated, could create a decisive victory for one side in this Mandalorian Civil War. And then we get what could be the biggest cameo of the season. This is a shot from Grogu's point of view during Order 66. We saw a bit of this in the book of Boba Fett. But now we see that there is someone coming after him. This immediately made me think of Qui-Gon Jinn and Obi-Wan coming after the Trade Federation in The Phantom Menace. George Lucas even said that this scene is meant to be a reverse of the monster coming through the door trope. So there's only one person with a lightsaber fighting the Jedi during Order 66, and that is Darth Vader. So we could see a Vader cameo this season, but I doubt it. But, but why? That would be, that would be so cool, but so, so why not? Well, okay, because to me, this looks more like it sparks from a welder that's like opening the door. And if Anakin would have met Grogu, then Grogu would be dead. The season is hinting that we might finally see who saved him. This might even set up the Ahsoka series. We actually did a video theorizing on who that could be, somebody with a connection to Ahsoka Tano. The video is a lot of fun. I suggest you check it out. Then we see TIE Interceptors chasing Bo-Katan's fighter, the Fang. But I thought the Empire was dead now. They beat them in Return of the Jedi. They're dead. Uh, yes and no. So, the Empire was decisively beaten at the Battle of Jakku. Then, some hardliners went off into the Unknown Regions and formed the First Order. And the Emperor's right-hand man, Masameda, surrendered to the New Republic afterwards. The Empire had to give up its military, but they were able to keep the few worlds that wanted to remain part of the Empire. They were just not allowed to expand. Some of these systems eventually did join the New Republic as a right-wing centrist party who wanted a stronger galactic government. There were also splinter governments like the New Separatist Union, the Confederacy of Corporate Systems, and the Sovereign Latitudes of Maricavania. So the New Republic was never a very strong united government. They even demilitarized like right after the war so they could be as different from the Empire as possible. With all these groups around, there are also various factions of the Empire, local warlords like Moff Gideon, who want to restore the Galactic Empire. And has been blessed with rare properties that have the potential to bring order back to the galaxy. So these TIE Interceptors could belong to any single one of those warlord sects. They're after Bo-Katan, and it does look like Mando flies into the same environment as M1 Starfighter to help her. This could precede the scene where he meets her in her throne room. Next, we see a bar filled with droids, which is a tongue-in-cheek callback to this. Your droids, they'll have to wait outside. We don't want them here. Now, I've always wondered why the bartender hates droids so much. Maybe it's because that they can record people in the bar and it's a seedy place where people don't want to record it. Or maybe he was a Clone Wars vet who had some droid resentment much like Din Djarin did. <laughs> No droids. This discrimination also mirrors segregation in the real world. So, just like in the real world, the oppressed minority have their own bar. The channel Eckhart Slider even pointed out that the droids seem to be drinking some kind of oil, but not fed into their mouths because they don't have mouths. It's a nice touch. We see protocol droids, a PA droid like A7 in A New Hope, and of course, battle droids. Battle droids have always been the highlight of the Clone Wars series. And be sure not to drop it. Whoa! and I'm hoping that we really get to have some fun with them in this season. And then we see Mandalorian paratroopers landing on what I think is Navarro. Now this, to me, looks like the cult led by the armor. This person in the lead here even looks like Paz Vizsla, who had words with Mando in Chapter 2. Our world was shattered by the Empire with whom this coward shares tables. But everything turned out fine. This is the way. 
This is the way. And actually, they did duel in the Book of Boba Fett. So now they have returned to Navarro, maybe to conquer it, and maybe to reclaim the place as their home base. They destroyed the statue of IG-11. You can see its foot here and the base of the statue here. Notice when this Nikto falls, we get the best cameo of the trailer. A whole family of little fricks. Of course, this is like the best character in The Rise of Skywalker. Somehow Palpatine returned. No, come on, play it, play the best thing. It's awesome. Hey, I love that guy. And there's another clue that this is the Armorer's faction in the teaser trailer. That showed one warrior in this battle wearing the Death Watch insignia on their pauldron. Next, we see Grogu in a cave, and this could be the same cave system where the Armorer's faction lives. Notice how the walls and floor are all melted, which tells you this is no ordinary cave. It's inside a dormant volcano. And then something hops down here to threaten him. Now, I don't think this is a creature because it has clothes. Looks like it's just like a local primitive. And then this. <laughs> Grogu, now confident in his Force abilities and using them to fight. And this is when I realized that for the entire trailer, Din was not narrating to his people or giving a rousing speech. He was simply teaching Grogu what it means to be a Mandalorian. This is the way. So my long-term theory is that Grogu becomes the king of these people, the immortal ruler of the Mandalorians. Kind of like Tar Vizsla, a Force-sensitive Mandalorian who wields the Darksaber and can lead his people forward into a new era. Then the title of the series would not refer to Din Djarin, it would instead refer to Grogu. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe, smash the bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.